tonight uh, we have a science lecture and uh, Isaac Miller's come from Cambridge to do that. Isaac is a student in veterinary science, uh, but he's actually specialising in neurobiology at the moment. Um, and therefore, we're going to have avail ourselves of his expertise this evening. Please feel free to ask any questions, um, but please retain them for the end of the presentation. If you want to ask a question remotely, um, there is a, a, a um, uh, a question and answer uh, tab. Um, the chat does not work. So actually the chat will not be somewhere where you will be putting your questions. Um, if you want to ask your question in person, um, then please actually just put your hand up and Isaac uh, will deal with that at the end of the lecture. Um, the Oxbridge Network is a network of schools of uh, around 12 schools at the moment, and we're still expanding. We run events for um, preparation for Oxbridge and to provide experience to everybody of what an Oxbridge tutorial or a supervision actually looks like, and also get them to think more broadly uh, about what uh, their subjects all about. Um, and so it's really about presenting challenges and interest to everybody um, in terms of broadening their minds and getting them to ask as many questions as um, they should, really, if they're interested in their subject. Now, um, the next event that we're going to have for the Oxbridge Net Network is actually for the lower six. Um, and um, we are um, going to have an Oxbridge Network essay prize. Uh, your coordinator should have details by the end of next week. Um, there is also going to be a tutorial event. This is for the lower six in preparation for application to Oxbridge on the 18th of March. And uh, you need to sign up for that through your Oxbridge coordinator. Um, there's one date that I haven't put on here, and that date is the 19th of March, where we are taking the Oxbridge Network on a trip to Girton, and there will be some um, workshops, and you'll get to meet some of the uh, students, but not just the students, also the admissions tutors. So that's the 18th of March and the 19th of March, and we encourage you also to uh, submit an essay for the Oxbridge Network Prize, and there is mandatory uh, prizes as well. So please uh, make sure that you do that if you're in the lower sixth. OK, I'm now going to hand over to um, Isaac. Um, he is going to do, is going to do a lecture as part of the Oxbridge Network lecture series. Should you wish to access any of the other lectures we've had so far, and we've had about 10, um, they are on the YouTube channel for which I will send a link um, over the next few days. I'm going to hand over to uh, Isaac now. I'll put his first slide up and Isaac can introduce himself and provide you with any details that he thinks are relevant um, before he actually starts. Now. Hopefully you should all be able to see the screen now. Um, please do say if you can't. Um, there's a few people in person, but Obviously, there's quite a few people online. I'll be making this as interactive as I can. Um, there'll be lots of questions to try and keep everyone engaged. Um, and hopefully you should really enjoy the lecture. Um, OK, so to introduce myself, my name's Isaac. Um, I was at Solihull Hill School for um, nine years. And I'm now at Robinson College, Cambridge, studying veterinary medicine. I'm in my third year. And in third year at Cambridge, um, all medics and vets um, intercalate. So we, we all specialise in one particular subject before we go on to clinical school. So personally, I've chosen to go into neuroscience, which isn't generally a common option for vets, but I, I'm really enjoying it. And so when, Do when Dr Foster asked me to, to deliver a lecture, I wanted to, to give some of you guys a taste um, of, of what neuroscience and neurobiology is about. Now, some of this content will be quite difficult, um, which is why, generally speaking, you don't get any neuroscience at all as part of um, the the curriculum taught in schools, but I'm going to try and simplify it as much uh, enough to give you a taste and, and to really see what it's about. OK, um, so my email address is, is down in the corner. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email me after after the lecture. Um, it will be on the final slide as well. But other than that, let's get going. Wow. 
requires the slide not to be there. No. Okay, brilliant. Um, so here's the plan for today. So we're going to start off by looking into just some of the basic principles, um, a general overlook over some of the really basic stuff in neurobiology. And then look at some really simple motifs and a motif. Well, I'll go on to explain what that is in, in a minute, but it's basically a common characteristic of circuits. And then we're going to look into some specific examples. So the two that I'm going to go into today are the olfactory bulb and the cerebellum. Cerebellum is kind of my area that I really enjoy. OK, so first bit, a bit of an interactive one. Um, what do you know about the nervous system? Feel free to say in person, piano from the same person or unmute. What do you know? Well, what would you say is the overall function? Any ideas? Sorry? Involuntary responses? What about when you decide to do something? So if it is a voluntary response and you decide to do something, do you think that's using your nervous system? Yeah, any other ideas, anyone? So there we've just got to all responses. That's the conclusion we've come to there. Sorry, someone's using the chat. Uh, it's not working. It's working. Um, nervous system is receiving and processing stimuli. That's a really good general um, description. That, that's kind of what I would agree with, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I would say is receiving information, processing information, transmitting information, um, and then some really general processes that follow from this. So general sensation, perception of the world around you, cognition, like thinking, movement, behavior. So some really kind of waffly, poorly defined words, i.e. the nervous system is involved in pretty much everything that an animal or a person does or doesn't do. When we think about dividing up the nervous system, what would we say, either anatomically or functionally? Any ideas, anyone? Either in person or use the chat or unmute and say. Uh, same person just gone and said the CNS and the PNS, correct? Yes, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. That's one good anatomical way of dividing them up. And that's that's the first step, really, which I would agree with. Um, any other ideas? What, what would you think of in terms of the parts of your body? We don't really talk about too much. Then we have divisions like the sympathetic. Yep. So Ishmael clearly knows what he's talking about there. Yep. There is the sympathetic nervous system. Um, Claire's saying axons and dendrons. Um, dendrites. Dendron is actually a, a mixture between an axon and a dendron. A dendrite is it is actually a thing that exists in some very unique cases. But um, yeah, so we'll, we'll get onto that in a second. But yeah, so definitely divisions there. Functional divisions like the sympathetic nervous system. So sort of what I'd say. So anatomically, as um, Ismail was saying a second ago, so central and peripheral nervous system. And then CNS is divided in, into the brain and the spinal cord. These are the your two areas that, again, as, as I was saying, you haven't really talked about too much in school, but the brain, spinal cord, the two big areas. And you've got many different regions within the two of them. And then functionally, so you were talking about the sympathetic nervous system. Yep, so we've got sensory systems to detect the world around us, motor systems. The sympathetic system is, is one type of, of nervous system, uh, sorry, one type of motor system even that implements a certain change. Um, higher order systems in the brain, the stuff that's responsible for memory, for planning, for thinking, for really quite complex stuff, for consciousness, whatever that is, we don't really know. Um, and anything that's involved in processing and planning. Okay, um, key functional components. Give me an idea of something from the smallest scale to the biggest. This is the most interactive slide. I just want to see what people know to start off with. We also have the parasympathetic, yes, we do. OK, brilliant. So that's really good. So a lot of people, what a lot of people would say to this question, I'd imagine, is on the smaller scale, the neuron or a nerve cell. Nerves are really peripheral nervous system. OK, you clearly know a lot. Wernicke's area and, and Broca's area. Yep, that's some really specialised knowledge. Um, OK, glial cells. Yep, OK. Anyway, um, really, really specialised knowledge. Well done. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah, OK, so neurotransmitters is going down to an even smaller scale. And that's sort of what I, what I would say. Um, the idea of a receptor receiving the neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter itself, the internal cellular machinery, it's really responsible for, for any changes. This is probably quite a, a subjective question. What really is the smallest scale? 
would you say a neuron? What is the functional unit? But that's that's a really good, really good idea there. And then up to the 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 largest scale, we're talking about entire brain regions, entire systems. Awesome. Okay, let's move on. There we go. And sorry, I, I was going to say that anatomically and functionally, um, these divisions do seem to overlap. Okay, so neurons, are they all the same? Kind of trick question. They, they definitely aren't. Um, throughout the entire nervous system, central, peripheral, and obviously any division in between, you see all different types of neurons. Um, here to give some examples of the differences. Um, here's a quick picture that indicates some of that variety. So if you look at the simplicity of a retinal bipolar cell, we don't need to go into what it is, but it is, it's a type of cell in the, in the eye, in the retina. Um, it's a very si simple unipolar design, and there's really not too much going on with it. Then if we go to a cerebellar Purkinje cell, which we're going to end up talking about towards the end of the lecture, there's a lot going on. The, um, the dendritic tree, which we'll talk about in a second, is, is immense. Um, now over to you very quickly. Can you identify some very common features of neurons? Um, apologies, um, anyone using the chat, please do un unmute to, to say, just in case I don't, I don't see. But um, you guys, person, any ideas? You will have covered neurons at, at, at GCSE and at a very basic level like this. Um, what sort of features of the cell, if you know? Yeah, go on. Synapses are, are connections that we're about to talk about in the next slide, but they're not exactly a feature of one neuron. If you look at this one cell, this is a hippocampal pyramidal cell. It doesn't really matter, but it is a, a pyramidal cell in the hippocampus. What are the common features that you can see? I'm just, uh, there's a few label lines on that. So those are different types of neuron. I'm looking at one neuron here. What are the specializations? Of... OK, brilliant. Yeah, OK. Any others? Any others? So that's, the axon is one. Dendrites, the dend dendritic tree, yeah? And cell body, you said, yeah. also known as the cell soma. Yeah, cool. Um, that's pretty much what I would say. So we've got the dendrites here, just as apical and basal, just different directional terms. The soma, the cell body, um, the axon, which is obviously the big transmitting um, conducting process. And then the axon hillock, which is actually where the electrical impulse is generated in the first place. OK. Um, so how is information transmitted across neurons? Now, some of you, um, I'm imagining a few people that are, are listening to this would say action potentials. Um, so the correct answer to that question would be that an action potential is transmitted across the across along the axon. It reaches the axon terminal. Then a synapse occurs with the dendrites of another neuron. Doesn't necessarily have to be the dendrite, but it usually is. Um, and a second action action potential is generated in the second order neuron. Now action potentials are often called spikes as well, but that's quite complicated in terms of the ionic basis of an action potential. Um, and really, it's only covered. In, even when it is covered quite simplistically at A-level. So today, we, we're not going to be talking about action potentials. We're just going to be talking about electrical impulses that are fired along cells. We don't necessarily need to talk about the basis of an action potential to, to discuss circuits and systems, which is what we, my plan is for today. OK, awesome. Right, so the concept of circuits. So given there's so much variation across neurons, um, we need some way to identify differences between, between neurons. There aren't, there's a million different types of cells. Let's really kind of simplify it a little bit to try and understand what we're dealing with here. And obviously, different circuits are doing different things in different contexts across different animals, at different times. So the, the easiest way to, to divide this, first of all, is um, to two groups. So number one, excitatory projection neurons. They activate the neuron that they connect to. Electrical impulse fires along them. They induce activity in the next neuron. And then inhibitory interneurons. Um, so they suppress activity in the neuron that they project to. Um, very simply, they stop that excitation. Those are that's the most general divide that we can do. Now, not all interneurons, which you would have heard of as relay neurons, relay neurons are also known as interneurons, same thing. Not all of them are inhibitory. There are some that aren't, but this is a generally a, quite a good divide. OK. OK, so as many different neurons in the brain are connecting to, to different cells um, across or via their axons and, and their dendrites, we quickly end up with complex meshworks. Um, so the, these are known as, as neural networks, um, also known as neural circuits. 
each carries out a very specific function and you end up with very large neural systems. This is just one mathematical representation of what a neural system might look like. This is very, very, very simplified. And it's actually kind of what artificial intelligence is trying to replicate. That's a whole other thing, so we're not going to get into that. OK, so synapses. We had a member of the audience here already talking about synapses. We're going to get to them now. So you're likely familiar with, um, with one type of synapse. And there's at least two key players. Somebody brought up glia earlier. That's beyond the scope of this lecture. Please go on and read about it. Really cool stuff. And um, they are also involved in, in synapses. We have the idea of a tripartite synapse. But for now, let's just talk about these two key players. So we have a presynaptic cell with its axon terminal, and we have a postsynaptic cell, which is receiving the synapse, um, either at the dendrite, could actually be at the cell body, could actually even be at the axon itself. So an axon projecting to an axon, and that's where it makes the synapse. Um, but this is called a chemical synapse. So we're talking about the release of neurotransmitters. These are little, these are chemicals that are transmitted across the synaptic cleft. Right. So neurotransmitters release into the synaptic cleft. It's recognized by receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, and this causes changes in this postsynaptic cell. This generates an electrical impulse in the second law cell, which can then be transmitted along. So we end up quickly with information being, being um, conducted along networks. Can you think of any other way of transmitting this information? So remember, electrical currents are based on ions. Um, this is one type of synapse, or a chemical synapse. Can we think of any other way of doing this? Do we think there has to be this gap? Anybody in person or, or online? Any suggestions? It's lots of people using the chat. I, I can't see that when I'm fully presenting, just so you're aware. Please do unmute and say, or raise your hand. Any other ideas from anyone? No, no worries, that's fine. OK, so. Another idea is something called a gap junction. So when I said a second ago, do we really need that space? There are some systems where we actually don't need it. Um, so a guy called Camillo Golgi, who you guys will know as the guy who discovered the Golgi apparatus in cells. He had a theory that all neurons in the brain were connected by a direct cytoplasmic connections. Everything is continuous. Ions can simply just flow through. This is the idea of a gap junction. Um, yeah, so ions are simply flowing through. There's no space at all. Can we think of any functional advantages, uh, any functional advantages of this in circuits? Anyone online? Use the chat if you want to. I'm looking at it right now. Quicker than diffusion. Um, so we are again relying on on diffusion of ions. So if there's still diffusion going on. Obviously, in a chemical synapse, there's um, there's a space where neurotransmitters must must diffuse across. It's not necessarily faster. No use for hormones. We're not talking about hormones here. Anything else? What's the if we have a bunch of cells that are connected in a circuit with direct cytoplasmic connections? Any ideas? No summation. Um, there would still be summation, but that's, yeah, again, that's very complicated stuff. Um, effect to a range of neural networks. We could still do that using normal chemical synapses. So, so one answer, um, and kind of the main answer that's generally agreed upon, is that we end up with a bunch of cells all firing at once together simultaneously. They all conduct that electrical impulse at the same time. It all goes through them. This means that you end up with a bunch of cells that are functionally one unit. This is really useful in certain areas of the brain that need to be constantly pulsing. So essentially pacemaker activity in some areas of the brain. We actually see the same thing in the heart. You have gap junctions between um, muscle cells in the heart, but obviously that's that's not that's outside the remit the, of the nervous system. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, right, so let's go back to chemical transmission. So here are a bunch of different types of neurotransmitter. So we've got the amino acid transmitters, glutamate, GABA, and glycine. These are the ones that you would be talking about quite a lot. The bioactive amines, the catecholamines, such as noradrenaline. Um, adrenaline is a hormone. Noradrenaline is slightly modified, and its um, half-life is much shorter. So it, it's used as a neurotransmitter, not a hormone. Then dopamine, serotonin, histamine. Acetylcholine is discussed quite a bit at A-level. 
ATP and adenosine are actually used as neurotransmitters in some rare situations. Neuropeptides and some gases, very, very speci specially generated. Um, OK. So glutamate, back at the start, of the amino acid transmitters, I said they were important. Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the CNS. So central nervous system is the primary excitatory one. GABA is the primary inhibitory one. And then in the spinal cord, glycine is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this might ring some bells from earlier for those of you that haven't really thought about excita excitation and inhibition before. But we've got a significant overlap here between some of these neurotransmitters and the categorization of neurons that we discussed earlier. So your excitatory cells, your projecting neurons and your inhibitory cells, inhibitory into neurons. So if we look at a brain neuron on a, on a slide histologically and we can identify some vesicles of glutamate, generally speaking, it's probably an excitatory cell. If it contains GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, it's probably inhibitory. And this is just one piece of evidence that we can use to identify and, and investigate the role of, of circuits. There are many, many different methods and they all have flaws. But this is one very simple piece of information we can use. And I also wanted to mention that many chemicals released at synapses have a modulatory function. They're referred to as neuromodulators. They're often heavy peptides. Um, and they don't induce the response, but they can alter it slightly and in, in affect the magnitude of it, the intensity of it, or the time scale of it, rather than induce it in the first place, which is an act achieved by the primary transmitter. OK, um, let's introduce spinal cord circuits. So, so despite being significantly less complex than the brain, we still don't actually have a full understanding of, of what's going on in the spinal cord, and we're waiting for a very long time. I'm talking now about local circuits in the spinal cord, local connections of, of neurons that are acting to produce simple undulating repetitive movements. So the step by step of walking, flying in birds, swimming in aquatic animals, um, running obviously. So lots of work has actually taken place using really simple model systems, um, such as the lamprey, which is kind of as low down in, in the vertebrate tree we can go, a fish without a jaw, um, the tadpole of, of Xenopus, a type of frog, and then even the fruit fly, Drosophila, if you guys have, there's definitely one practical A level using Drosophila. Fly. And obviously that's very, very separate from, from humans. How do we know that it's the same sort of thing going on or animals? Um, but those are the systems that we use. And so there's far fewer neurons than in brain systems, and they're far less interconnected with each other than brain circuits are. And we also have a hierarchical understanding of the brain. The hierarchy, so in terms of the brain and the spinal cord, sorry. So motor regions in the brain, specific areas of the brain concerned with movement, motor control, they give off tracks of axons, loads of axons that run down the cord. They descend to modulate or control this spinal activity. So we have a hierarchical idea. And this means that in measuring spinal cord activity, it's really difficult to measure any local circuits in isolation because they're constantly being modulated. They're constantly being controlled by the brain and any other circuits around them. However, we can recognize certain features in these circuits that do appear across neurobiology, across circuits, across animals. These are known as motifs, just very unique, might be only be a few cells in a particular arrangement that we can see over and over again. And some particular motifs control spinal reflexes. OK, let's talk about. Let's talk about those particular motifs. Right, so I'm going to talk about two functionally distinct motifs. Before we can do that, I'm going to talk very quickly about a stretch reflex in the spinal cord. So what you're seeing at the top of the diagram is a hemisection half of the spinal cord, the weird half butterfly wing. And if we just look at the main red um, loop, the, the really big loop to start with, so there's a very simple circuit here that underlies something we call the monosynaptic stretch reflex. This is what we test using a tendon hammer, which you might have seen used to tap the, the patella tendon. A lot, a lot of doctors will do that. And so the circuit begins with an afferent fibre. Afferent just means that it, it's going towards. Um, that is excited by movement or stretch in a muscle. So that could be just a disturbance of the muscle. It could be that you pick something up and it happens to be heavier than you're expecting. Now, this afferent is normally making a connection right around with the motor neuron in the spinal cord. This is what you were talking about earlier in terms of reflexes. Your sensory neuron. This is, in effect, a sensory neuron. It's just, it's just a specialized circuit. But there's no relay neuron in this case directly. We just go straight from this afferent straight to a motor neuron. And this motor neuron pulls supplying the same muscle. So we have a direct negative feedback loop. You might have talked about negative feedback before. The idea that something happens, your controller recognizes that there's been a change, and therefore we have a 
and, and input. So there's a constant circuit there to modify, well, to, to essentially keep the muscle contracted despite any, any dis changes or disturbances. Right, let's now introduce something alongside that simple loop. So one of these motifs is called feed forward inhibition. It's a useful motif that allows us to suppress or, or inhibit one system whilst another is activated. So this relies on a second axonal projection, also known as a collateral, collateral just means to the side, um, that excites an inhibitory interneuron. So again, we're talking about inhibitory interneurons. So this, this sec second projection excites the inhibitory interneuron, and then that goes on to inhibit some other system. So we have an excitation and then an in inhibition occurring. That again, just depends on the neurotransmitter and the receptors that are present. Right, so in this simple circuit, in the spinal cord, the afferent gives off a second axon that excites the interneuron. The interneur interneuron then inhibits the motor neuron pool, supplying an antagonist muscle. So we were talking before about the agonist, that one muscle in this case, it's the flexor. So the flexor maybe biceps in this case. At the same time as, we, as, as we're doing stuff with biceps, triceps is being inhibited. So the extensor is being inhibited. Right, question for you guys. Why might this be a useful motif to have as part of a spinal cord reflex? Anyone online, unmute, say in the chat, or in person? What's the use of inhibiting or suppressing activity in the extensor while there's activity in the flexor? Or while we're trying to control activity in the flexor? Anyone? In person? Yeah, awesome. Well then, preventing conflicting functions, for example, avoiding activation of the bicep while the tricep is working. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly what we're talking about here. If we mess around with the tricep, if we allow it to, to, to operate in any way, um, then we can be we can be seriously overcorrecting, we can be seriously undercorrecting, and generally speaking, it, it's not great. So this is quite a useful motif to have in place to allow us to really just focus on the flexor. Well done. That was really good. OK, so next we've got feedback inhibition. This is the second of the two motifs. So it's another useful motif, but for very different reasons. So again, there's a collateral. There's another, there's another axon fiber that comes off. So there's basically two axons at one point. But this time, this is from the second order neuron. So just the second one along, which projects back to and excites an inhibitory interneuron, which except, exerts its effect back on the second order neuron. So it's all a very simple loop, right focused on that second neuron. So in the spinal cord, this does exist. The second order cell is the motor neuron, and the inhibitory interneuron has been identified to be a specific type of cell called a Renshaw cell. So it's a very small cell compared to the motor neuron and compared to the afferent fiber, but it's activated by the motor neuron and then goes on to inhibit the motor neuron. So a very small loop. So the effect of this, of this motif is, is uh, we activate the motor neuron, we end up with stability of the muscle, we counteract any disturbance, but soon after, we have a quick inhibitory current that's applied back to the motor neuron cell body, so it can't generate any electrical signals. So the period of activity that results in the muscle is brief. Why is this important? Why do we want the activity to only be very short? Don't be afraid to unmute, guys. You can keep using the chat, but I'm not always looking at it, so please do. <laughs> Any ideas in person? Hopefully you can see how that period of activity is brief. We activate use and reflexes. Everything we're talking about right now is reflexes. This is all reflexes, very quick movement through it, through the cord. The electrical um, signal goes quickly through the cord and ends up with a response. This is all reflexes, even all spinal reflexes. So the period of activity is really brief. If we kept that activity in the muscle and it kept going further to counteract a disturbance, what would happen? If the activity was continuous? No. So we'd massively overcorrect. We'd end up going way too far the other way. So we just need a very quick correction for that disturbance. Um, anything too far is, is, is not what we need. So that's why that, that inhibition is in place in, in the cord. Okay. <clears throat> right, now let's take a closer look at some of the circuits within specific systems themselves. 
So the two that I want to talk to you about today are olfaction in the olfactory bulb and then motor control via the cerebellum. So I'll take you through those. You probably have no idea what those words mean. That's totally fine. But um, we're going to go through them now. So first, the olfaction. Behold the olfactory bulb. OK, so the olfactory bulb is an invention of vertebrates. It's only found in vertebrates. It's designed to process sensory information in the form of chemicals in the surrounding medium. So this could be water if you're an aquatic animal. This could be the air if you're a terrestrial or if you're a bird. Um, so just in this diagram on the, on the right, it's a fish, actually, but it, it's the same, same idea. Um, so the OB is, is olfactory bulb um, top there. So in other words, it's the part of the brain that first recognises what you are smelling. The sense of smell is olfaction. This is very, very well studied. It's the most well studied sensory system. OK. So in terms of evolution, just to quickly touch on, on this for anybody that's interested, this is a really, really old system. So it represents the oldest of the special senses. It's um, it predates vision, it predates hearing, it predates um, somatic sensation. And it's a primary signal for direction in some of these early vertebrates, so some of these jawless fish. So towards or away from the source of an odorant could be that they smell some food and therefore they go towards it. Could be they smell a predator and therefore they get out of there as fast as they can. Following? OK, so in some people would say lower vertebrates, such as fish, amphibians and reptiles, the olfactory bulb can be proportionally enormous compared to other brain regions. Here is a picture of a caiman. And you can see the size of the olfactory bulb at the front. Um, compared in, in the human brain, it's comparatively much smaller. Our cerebrum is enormous, but um, it, it's only about half the size of the cerebellum. It's pretty big. And again, this just goes to show how the sense of smell is really important to, to all animals. OK, um, just one last point to make about how old the olfactory bulb is. I'm really trying to show this in here. So other than their inv involvement in, in we can't really call them reflexes because they're going through the brain. There's quite a few more synapses, but rapid responses. If you see something flying towards you, you jump out the way. That's visual information. So visual, auditory, somatosensory and gustatory, meaning taste information. They all first flow through a region of the brain called the thalamus. This is a functional relay center. It then diverts everything everywhere else, like a bus station. Um, the olfactory system, however, is so old that it doesn't, and it actually is functionally ingrained with all other circuits in the brain. It doesn't go through the thalamus. So sensory information enters any processing center from the sensory periphery, no matter what sense we're talking about. And in the case of olfaction, this is the olfactory epithelium, which is located in the nasal cavity. Um, yeah, so it should be there on that diagram. Um, you can see it's in the nasal cavity there, the pink. And then we have a small piece of bone in the skull called the cribriform plate, part of the mesethmoid bone. And then that goes straight through to the brain. This is directly taken from Candell, a really, really important textbook. Um, OK, so receptors on very special sensory neurons called olfactory sensory neurons, they bind to and recognize specific chemicals. This generates an electrical signal which is transmitted ac across uh, along these axons into the brain, into the olfactory bulb. So there in the bottom left is, is a diagram showing on the, at the bottom, we've got the olfactory sensory neurons in the um, olfactory epithelium, goes through the cribriform plate to the brain in the olfactory bulb, this oval shaped thing. This is the olfactory bulb. Awesome. The axons reach the bulb and there they make synaptic connections with two types of cells, mitral cells and tufted cells. And they then go on to higher brain regions. By higher, I mean more complicated, more processing, essentially giving rise to more complicated um, experiences. So it could be involved with, with all the facts I'm about to talk about now. Um, so. Connections to other brain regions are also very deeply ingrained. Information flows via these mitral and tufted cells onto the olfactory cortex and then onto the amygdala and the piriform cortex. Don't worry about these names. But these are parts of the limbic system, which are really to do with uh, memory and emotion. And this is a really direct connection between your sense of smell and memory. So, I mean, I, I imagine people have experienced a smell that takes you back to a certain time or feeling in your life. Um, if you, you guys ever experienced that. You've, you've smelt something and then all of a sudden you're back somewhere. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of what underlies that. However, we have a problem in, with the current arrangement. So because different sensory neurons are going to respond to different odorants, odorants just mean odour causing chemicals, if there are a number of really strong odorants around, which is, a set, which is basically realistic, 
we could end up with multiple signals being conducted to the mitral and tufted cells all at once. So lots of information is being conveyed. There's nothing particularly specific. We need to really boil it down to what's important. So it could be that one of these signals relates to the presence of a predator, whilst the others relate to harmless features of the environment. Obviously, the predator one's the important one. If we don't recognise that and run away, we're going to die. The harmless features of the environment, we can generally ignore those. But we need to be able to figure that out. Our brain has to be able to figure that out. The sensory experience needs to be fear, so we can escape the predator. So how can we make sure that one sensory stimulus dominates and so goes on to cause fear? We have an answer to that. So the answer is a really common motif called lateral inhibition. Lateral literally just means to the side of something. So we're talking about inhibition like before, inhibitory into neurons, just inhibition. So this is a process allowing one fibre in the middle to diminish the strength of the signals in the fibres around them. So one can dominate the middle. In this way, we're going to increase contrast. So one signal or more than one is able to dominate. The idea of repressing everything else so the thing in the middle can become much bigger. OK. It's not surprising that this motif is found across sensory systems. We see it in vision. We see it between photoreceptors, as in for light. We see it between sets of mechanoreceptors in the, in the skin. So that's your somatic, somatic sensation, feeling of touch. There's different ways of accomplishing lateral inhibition using different numbers and arrangements of interneurons. Again, we're talking about inhibitory interneurons, inhibition to the side. This is where this gets really interesting. So we know for certain that there's def definitely lateral inhibition going on in the olfactory bulb. But again, this is still a very complicated brain system. We're talking about billions of neurons between mitral cells. Sorry, we know that lateral inhibition is going on between mitral cells. We don't know exactly how this is achieving the olfactory bulb. That's what I'm saying in terms of it being very complicated. We don't know exactly how this is happening. But in 2020, um, Wanner and Friedrich, they published a paper that explored one possible mechanism that would produce the patterns of activity in mitral cells that line up pretty well with what we see when we record specifically the electrical signals from these cells. I'm gonna run through that now. So here's the diagram from their paper. It's an incredibly complicated paper that took me a while to properly to get, get, get to the grips of, but um, this is a really good um, diagram that highlights the conclusion pretty well. The first thing that happens is one mitral cell, so one of these triangles here, they get, get activated particularly strongly by a dominating odour. So they're excited. They're, we've got a lot of electrical activity going on in them. OK, that flows down their axons. They have collateral axons. Again, they have more than one axon, as we talked about earlier. They're going to go on to activate inhibitory interneurons. These are the blue cells here. In neuroscience, generally speaking, if it's an arrow, that means excitation. If it's a, a line with a perpendicular line to it, that means inhibition, as in we're stopping um, excitation in that cell that we're touching. So we have inhibitory interneurons that are activated by this one mitral cell that's activated very strongly. These inhibitory interneurons then provide the same intensity of inhibition to all the mitral cells. So the other mitral cells that haven't been activated by this one odour, they're all going to be um, inhibited. So will the, the original one as well. Actually, we're including the strongly activated mitral cell. Everything is now inhibited, but it's at the same intensity of inhibition. So this stops and reduces firing in laterally located mitral cells that carry information for other odors. But because this first mitral cell is already excited very well, it's already quite strongly ex excited, it's not functionally affected very much by the inhibition. And it's able to deliver its information to higher processing centers in the brain. We don't totally inhibit the activity in that, that one um, cell because it's already quite strongly activated. Think of it as, as we're starting at a more positive level. Therefore, when we have subtraction, we have that inhibition of activity, it is affected much less. It's still active, whereas everything else is taken down to zero. Not, there's no activity in that cell. So the key thing here is that the mitral cell that is excited and so fires either earliest or the most strongly will dominate. This is called a winner takes all mechanism. Following? Happy? Awesome. Next, I have some questions to kind of keep you engaged. So, questions on the screen. Hopefully, you guys can, can see it, obviously, as well. Um, which group does not have an olfactory bulb? Is it A, reptiles, B, birds, C, insects, or D, mammals? Could we maybe use hands up function on the team's call? Would that work? Um, if 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 I go through through each answer and you just put your hands up, that would be 
Amazing. OK, so uh, who's going to say A, reptiles? B, birds? C, insects? And then D, mammals? This one, you had your hand up the entire way through. <laughs> um, OK, so the answer is C, insects. Um, I said it was an invention of vertebrates. Insects are not vertebrates, everything else is. OK, cool. Next question. What cells are directly activated by olfactory sensory neurons? Is it A, both mitral and pyramidal cells? Is it B, cerebellar Purkinje cells? Is it C, just mitral cells? Or is it D, mitral and tufted cells? A couple hands up for that one. Um, so the answer is D, mitral and tufted cells. We talked about mitral cells specifically in, in the example that was given, but it is mitral and tufted cells that we mentioned the olfactory receptor neuro, olfactory sensory neurons uh, making synapses with. Okay, last question. What common mechanism um, most enhances contrast in sensory systems? Is it A, feed forward inhibition? Is it B, lateral inhibition? Two hands here. You on the screen, someone's using the chat. Is it C, feedback inhibition? Or is it D, reciprocal inhibition? Yeah, it was lateral inhibition B. Amazing, right. On to the final bit of my talk today. So now we're going to be talking about the cerebellum, the little brain. This is going to get quite complicated now, so don't be afraid if it all seems like quite a lot. This is more to give you a taste of what neurobiology is about. OK, so a little bit of an intro to the cerebellum, which is kind of my favourite area of neuroscience. This is actually a dog brain, just if, if you're wondering um, it, if, why it's not directly upright. Um, but it, it, the general the, the area is the same. Mammals, generally speaking, have very conserved um, neuroanatomy. OK, so the cerebellum is this weird cauliflower looking thing at the caudal or posterior aspect of the brain. If you're a vet like me, you say caudal. If you're a medic, you'd say posteriorly. Like, um, so this is an incredibly folded structure that's located very or posteriorly in the brain. And the easiest way to introduce the function of the cerebellum is by talking about lesion studies. So by a lesion, we literally just mean a disturbance to the, the system in some way. It could be surgical, could be with, with chemicals, could be using pathogen microbiomes. Um, OK. So the first person to really ex explore the function of, of the cerebellum was um, a neurologist called Gordon Holmes. He was in the army during the First World War and was the first to write about what the possible role of the cerebellum was, possible function that it had. So because the helmet worn by Allied soldiers in the war didn't protect the posterior skull, he did notice some really common behavioural characteristics um, in, in anyone that suffered from gunshot injuries that affected um, the caudal brain, the posterior brain, um, gunshot injuries that damaged the cerebellum. There's a diagram there just to indicate sort of what we're talking about. Um, the helmet didn't protect it. So Holmes wrote that after a, cerebellar, ah, after a cerebellar lesion, it was as if each movement is being performed for the first time. That's a very famous quote from him about the cerebellum. And this is his paper that he wrote. The symptoms of acute cerebellar injuries due to gunshot injuries by Gordon Holmes, MD. Won't, if, won't go through all of that, but that was his paper written in December 1917. So in people and animals with cerebellar injury, either resulting from trauma, disease or a failure of development in the first place, which is cerebellar hyperplasia, no sensory or intellectual deficits are generally observed. That's, that's a very common finding. Well, almost all the time. What we see is a series of motor disorders that are globally generally referred to as cerebellar ataxias. This literally just means bad movement. We don't see good motor control. So these patients represent with hypotonia, so weakness in your muscles, dysmetria, which basically means inappropriate displacement in movements. So if I'm reaching for a door handle, I might reach too far 
and punch the door and might reach not far enough and then grasp and they actually haven't reached the door handle. That's dis dysmetric movements. Dysdiodokokinesis, which is a bit of a mouthful, and basically refers to an inability to perform sequences of movements often alternating. So the, the one that, I, that is often used is constantly tapping the other side of your arm. Somebody with cerebellar injury would really, really, really struggle with that. Um, the last thing, or the last big thing, is decomposition of movement. So a general lack of coordination across joints. We were taught, I, I gave the example of opening a door. Maybe people so say you need to use the shoulder joint, then you need to use the elbow joint, then you need to use your wrist, and then you need to use each finger joint individually. And that would all really decompose and it would all really not be correctly timed. So that's basically what we see in patients with cerebellar injury. So the overall conclusion, as we said a second ago, is that cerebellum is involved in motor control and it has no obvious role, at least in animals. There's some, some interesting research going on in, in humans in terms of very high, high level functions. And this is actually where uh, cerebellar injury might have a role in autism. The overall conclusion is that it has no obvious role in sensory reception or higher level cognition. However, it seems to play no role in initiating movement in the first place. There are actually some structures at the base of the cerebrum, the big bit of the brain that you often think of when you think brain. Um, so I'm, I'm back on the picture a minute ago. Um, it's called the basal ganglia, probably involved with initiating movement there, but that's a whole different circuit and way too much to go into. And much less is known about them. So this has resulted in the current consensus that everyone around the world thinks that the cerebellum is concerned with control over the parameters of movement. So for the force of movement, speed, timing, coordination, not whether we're starting movement in the first place, but how fast we're going to move, what joints we're going to use, how well we time it with other movements and what else is going on in the world around us. So let's zoom in on cerebellar circuits themselves. So Santiago Ramón y Cajal was, well, he is referred to as the father of modern neuroscience. In 1911, he, ref he said that cerebellar cortical structure, so the, the structure of the cerebellar cortex, which just means the exterior of the cerebellum, you have the cortex in many different organs, many different regions of the body. It is simple and highly ordered. That's a very famous quote, and many essays start off with it. So the relatively simple structure of the cerebellum has allowed much more study into cerebellar circuits than circuits in any other region of the brain. And the amount of research that, that has been done in the banks of, of papers on cerebellum, it, it's enormous. Um, many, many, many famous neuroscientists have spent their entire careers working on the cerebellum, manipulating and investigating these particular circuits. Um, yeah. So there's only five major cell types in the cerebellum. We're going to go through and explore them individually now. And this makes it much simpler than, for example, the hippocampal formation. You guys might have heard of the hippocampus. Conventionally, we think of it as being associated with memory um, and, and memory functions. But there, there's over 100 different types of cell. So intrinsically, that's straight away much more complicated and much harder to understand. Whereas in the cerebellum, there's only five. And in terms of an idea of its importance, we're going to talk about cerebellar granule cells in a moment. They're the red cells on the screen. But 60% of all the neurons in the brain are cerebellar granule cells. This is actually an astronomical investment, if you really think about it. The entire brain, and we're talking about just the cerebellum, one particular region at the back, and 60% of all the neurons in the brain are granule cells in the cerebellum. So this is a huge energetic and evolutionary investment. So whatever the cerebellum is doing, it's definitely very important. This is a very simplified schematic that I, I've, I've drawn personally, actually, of just the structure of the cerebellar cortex and the deep nuclei. Um, we have the cortex on the outside and the deep nuclei in the middle. We're now going to deconstruct it cell by cell. OK, so the cerebellum is really, really finely folded. Um, we refer to each, each slice, each leaf as, as folia. Um, and basically the structure of, of cerebellar circuits is, is such that it, it's arranged in a planar fashion. So we have one leaf, for example, here that we're going to zoom in on. And I've, I've just sort of shown that it, it's an extrapolation out. Um, we see this, this arrangement time and time and time again, millions and billions of times, all in these leaves. It's really, really tightly packed together. But the cortex and exterior, the deep nuclei on the interior. Right. Of these cell types, just so you don't get confused, when I refer to them now, I'm going to have the text in the colour of, of that cell. Um, so you should be able to identify them if you forget. But we're going to run through them now. So in green here, we have a type of cell called mossy fibres. By fibre, I just mean the axon. So the cell body will be located in different places, but these are the axons coming into the circuit. Remember, the arrow is excitation, 
the line at the end of at the end of the axon means inhibition. So mossy fibers are glutamatergic. They release glutamate. If you remember earlier, we talked about glutamate being the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. So it's, they are glutamatergic and they're excitatory to the granule cells. And they also make a second excitatory connection directly to the deep nuclei in the interior. So the impulses that they have, the, the signals that they conduct, represent a really complex message. They carry sensory information from throughout the entire body. This will indicate body position as well as external context. So visual information, auditory information, olfactory information, touch information, proprioceptive information indicating the state that the joints are in, how, how the body is arranged. Those are mossy fibres. Now we move on to granule cells. We talked about them being 60% of all neurons in the brain. Immense investment. So they're activated by mossy fibres. They're excited by them. And their axons basically spread out into something that we call parallel fibres simply because they are arranged parallel to each other. I've drawn three there, but there are millions, as you can imagine, um, at any one time. And so they extend to the cortical exterior and they make glutamatergic and excitatory connections with the Purkinje cells. So directly where the red line meets the blue, the Purkinje cell, that's where we have glutamatergic excitatory connections with the Purkinje cells. The Purkinje cell itself, the really big blue one, this is the focus of most research in the cerebellum. It receives connections from many millions of granule cells. So it represents a functional integration of lots of contextual information from the body. It makes a single GABAergic and inhibitory connection down to the cells of the deep cerebellar nuclei. That's what that line means. GABA, we talked about being most, common, most commonly found as an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Okay, and in black, we have the deep nuclei cells of the cerebellum. These are the functional output. The only information leaving the cerebellum, this little computational unit, it's literally like a little computational processor. The only, the only information leaving is via the deep nuclei cells. That's what the big arrow there is. So they are simultaneously activated by the mossy fibers and then inhibited by the Purkinje cells. There's two different inputs there. And if you can actually see from the mossy fibers, we've got an indirect loop. This goes via the granule cells, via the parallel fibers, through the Purkinje cells inhibition of the nuclei, as well as just a direct excitation. So there's a bit of a balance there going on between excitation and inhibition, and that's going to be really important in a minute. So their projections, the deep nuclei projections, they run to other motor regions of the brain. They activate very complex motor programs that activate neurons that go on, go on to activate muscles, and that's, that's really, really complex. And that goes through the motor cortex, other regions of the brain. Basically, motor programs are initiated, just like a computer program, but it's a motor program. Then in orange here, we have climbing fibers. So, so named because they climb and intertwine with the Purkinje cells. They project from a region of the hindbrain called the pons, and they make connections at the parallel fiber Purkinje cell synapses. Now they're thought to carry the error signal that fires very strongly when a movement is incorrect. They're, this is also known as the learning signal. So if I reach for this mouse and I miss it, when I'm hitting the table instead, that fires that error signal. My climbing fiber will fire. This is a quite a rare event. We're recognizing that something isn't quite right. It's not exactly what we're expecting. But, in, but um, activity through the foot mossy fibers and through the rest of the circuit is, is continuous all the time. Right, now we're getting on to the last thing that I really want to consider. This is the really hard stuff. So the theory of cerebellar learning, this is referred to as the Mar-Albus theory, the Mar-Albus model. So this was proposed by David Marr, a neuroscientist, and James Albus, a mathematician, not a Harry Potter character. Um, this theory basically suggests that the cerebellum carries out a very uniform computation, the same computation every single time, and it just applies it to different contexts, just applies it to different sensory information. So the hypothesis can't right now be 100% proven or disproven. We simply don't have the tools to 100% prove it. We also don't have the tools to disprove it, really. But it lines up very well with experimental evidence that we have from these cells, from these circuits, and provides the foundation for almost all recent cerebellar research. All papers will talk about this to some degree. This mechanism, this is quite wordy, but I'm going to try my best to explain it to you, enables the development of a feed-forward connection. So we have a direct connection that doesn't have to worry about processing. You don't have to worry about complex thought and really thinking about where your hand needs to end up to reach the mouse. The connection is there. We know exactly what parameters we need. We can predict the exact parameters of movement required given a specific context. So given the location of our joints, given, again, we're talking about the center information. 
So for a good example that, is, that I've given here is a child that tries to catch a ball the first few times, they're going to fail time and time again. That's just pretty much going to happen. They're going to reach their arm out too far. They might not grasp the ball at the exact time the ball hits their palm. They're going to keep that climbing fiber signal is going to keep firing over and over and over again. And that eventually they learn the correct coordination program, which can be tapped into whenever a ball is seen flying towards them. They know exactly where to reach their hand. Their fingers clench around the ball at the exact time. They haven't thought about that, but it's happened. Some people refer to this as muscle memory. OK, so let's actually go into what's happening here. This is very tough stuff. So mossy fiber activity is constant. There's a never ending feed of sensory information into the cerebellar circuitry. It's always going through. That's something we have to accept. OK, however, when expected movement does not quite occur to the correct parameters, the climbing fiber fires. That's your error signal, your learning signal. In the orange. Now, this is the really crucial thing. When the activity in the climbing fiber occurs, that learning signal, at the exact same time as activity occurs from the parallel fiber, from the red to the Purkinje cell blue synapse. So that those two the activity is going through those two routes at the exact same time, through the climbing fiber and from the parallel fiber to the Purkinje cell. This is going to induce changes in the synapse in the Purkinje cell from that Purkinje cell side. So we're, we're talking about changing the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse. But this relies on activity in the climbing fiber. That's really crucial to be able to understand this. So the change that this is specifically is that it depresses this synapse. It reduces the efficacy of information transfer would be the fancy way of putting it. But it basically just means that the Purkinje cell is much less activated by mossy fiber information. Activity in the red granule cell is not going to activate the Purkinje cell as much. OK, happy with that? Yeah, sorry, I've, I've just circled specifically in synapse that we're talking about there in black, little black circle at the top, specifically the red cell to the blue cell, parallel fiber to the Purkinje cell. OK, so this change in Purkinje cell excitability, we've decreased its excitability. It means the magnitude of the inhibition it delivers the deep nuclei decreases. Remember, we've just got an electrical impulse running down that Purkinje cell, just an electrical impulse, and we've dec decreased how much, how strong that impulse is because of that change resulting from the climbing fiber signal. This means that when that electrical signal reaches the, the axon terminal, where an, in, 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 uh, an inhibitory signal is being transmitted, less inhibition is going to happen. Those of you that are more mathematically inclined will think about this as a double negative. We're removing inhibition. We're removing some of that negativity. So, I mean, personally, as, as a neurobiologist, I refer to this as disinhibition. We're removing inhibition, i.e. we're going the other way. We're going in a positive direction, i.e. we're exciting. This means that we're much better able to respond to direct excitation from the mossy fibers. That arrow that we talked about earlier, that balance between that the arrow and the line, the balance between the excitation of the deep nuclei and the inhibition of the deep nuclei. Now we've decreased how strong the inhibition is. Therefore, we can respond better to the direct excitation. This is learning. This is effectively the basis of learning. So this now enables a really rapid response with the exact and corrected parameters of movement whenever a familiar and specific set of sensory context is encountered. And this is achieved via the deep nuclei cells activating very specific motor areas. That's what we're talking about. It goes on to activate that program. So a key point to make here is that this all relies on changes in the circuitry. In neuroscience, this is an idea known as plasticity. Constant changes, constant adaptations. The circuit is plastic. Right, over to you guys to see how well you've coped with that. What clinical sign would you expect to see in a patient with cerebellar injury? Sorry, Ishmael, Hebb theory of neuronal growth? Does this have any relation to Hebb's theory? I'll answer that question at the end. Um, yeah, so which, which clinical sign would you expect to see in a patient with cerebellar injury? So uh, again, hands up on, on the, the team school. I, I, I can see all of you right now. So um, A, visual deficits. Would we expect to see visual deficits with someone with cerebellar injury? What about B, an inability to move when they want to? Got one, one for that. Maybe two, don't know. Um, C, problems with memory. And lastly, D, they struggle to walk in a straight line. 
one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's correct. They struggle to walk in a straight line. So we're talking about inability to coordinate properly. Inability to coordinate movement. OK, next. What is the only inhibitory cell in the cerebellar circuit? Is it A, a Purkinje cell that releases glutamate? Is it B, a granule cell that releases GABA? Got one person for that. Is it C, a Purkinje cell that releases GABA? Got a few people for that, three. Um, and then, or is it D, granule cell that releases glutamate? Or is the only inhibitory cell? The answer was C, a GABA urgent Purkinje cell. Brilliant. OK, now we're going to wrap up. OK, so all well and good, but how much do we really know about neuroscience for sure? And the cerebellum is a really good question topic to ask this question, to be honest, because so much research has gone into it. So we can really start to think, how much do we really know? Um, there's two main issues that the field is encountering. The first is that if we take tissue and isolate it, so say specifically the spinal cord of the tadpoles or, or something, um, where the brain's been detached and we're specifically looking at the spinal cord circuits, we could be leaving out neurons that take part in some of these functional circuits that control the activity in real life in vivo. Could be that some of these descending tracks from the brain are actually really controlling the stuff and it's what we'd always see in real life. But we've removed that from the brain, we've cut that off. So what we're measuring isn't normal, it's not physiological. It could be that a neuron is anatomically much further away, but its axon projects all the way to a circuit somewhere. And if this is the case, if we if we leave that neuron out, then what we're measuring from the circuit, again, as I said, it's not normal. By non-physiological, I just mean not a normal occurrence in body. Number two, if we introduce lesions, so disturbances, they could be surgical, they could be genetic, they could be chemical, they could be viral, um, into a circuit to knock out any particular component of that circuit um, or stimulate any of these components using a degree of stimulation, degree of excitation that you've never seen normally in real life. We're fundamentally changing the circuit. Before we were just talking about the cerebellum, we talked about how coincident inputs from two different points cause the change in the strength of a synapse. So if we're messing around with the circuit by stimulating it, there could be changing, there could be adaptation. Circuits are plastic. Also, if we remove a component, all of a sudden something else could increase or decrease. If, so then if we make any measurements, come to any conclusions, how can we be sure that they're directly applying in real life? Those are two really big problems. Do any of these uncertainties really matter though? What do you think? I wanna know what you guys think, either in person or Please do unmute. It would be nice to hear a voice on one. Seems cool. That would be good. Um, tell me what you tell me what you think. Someone be brave. Go on. Do these uncertainties matter? Does it really matter that we don't have total confidence in the results that we have? Any ideas? You not? Yeah. Um, so the idea that we've just had, you just said, yeah, fair. OK. Um, yeah. So, I mean, from a clinical point of view, if we don't totally understand, so you, again, you're taking a clinical aspect there. I'm going to counter that in a second. But if you if we don't fully understand the exact effects across the entire nervous system of the, of the intervention or the, the treatment that we have, then something could go wrong and stuff has gone wrong. There are clinical trials that have gone disastrously wrong because of this reason. Totally true. Um, however, well, has anybody else got anything else to, to add first? Ishmael just says, yeah. Does anybody have anything else to add? We've got one person that said, yeah, it really matters. Anybody going to maybe try and back up the point of view that says, no, actually, we don't need to know? I mean, this is totally subjective. This is this is where it all becomes really up to you, whether you think it matters. Do we really need to worry about knowing everything down to the minute level of detail? Given that right now we probably can't. Anyone? No? OK, cool. So sort of my thoughts personally, I'm quite split on it. I would say for practicing, for practicing clinicians, so for example, neurologists, so personally, I would be going on to clinical vet school after this. I would be looking at the real clinical impl implications of this stuff. Personally, I would say probably not, which is directly a contrast to what you're saying. We may not totally understand the widespread effects and, and the mechanisms behind what's going on of the clinical interventions we have at our disposal, 
but we know that a lot of them work. So for example, for patients with Parkinson's, one of the main treatment options that we have is inducing levodopa. We don't really understand a lot of the extra effects that this will have throughout the brain, throughout the nervous system. Um, and, but we know they do provide some benefit. So why would we not deliver that intervention, that trick gone? drugs too like they have loads of side effects right. we totally just don't know but in some cases they provide some clinical benefit so again it you you, yeah. you have to balance it personally i would say we don't necessarily have to know every time otherwise why bother doing anything neurological at all why do we bother treating anyone with neurodegenerative disease but that's that's one side the other side i would say it's for pure neuroscientists working to make developments in the field. So not from a clinical perspective now, obviously that's kind of my avenue, but for what I'm currently doing at the moment, pure neuroscience, if we don't have absolute confidence in even some of the simplest concepts that we have, how can we take those ideas further? How can we make any breakthroughs that are accurate and useful? Right, so I'm gonna summarize what I've done for you today. So the first thing we did was we said that the central nervous system is an incredibly complex network of biological circuits. Common neuronal architecture known as motifs show up time and time again, and they help us to understand the function of a circuit. We talked about the spinal motifs, feed forward inhibition and feedback inhibition, and then lateral inhibition. We then talked about in the case of the olfactory bulb. So we discussed the olfactory bulb as an example of a sensory system. We said that this processing isn't simple, even just in this first brain region that this information is reaching, and there are many, many challenges that the circuit faces before a conscious sensory experience can occur. We talked about one problem, and we talked about how lateral inhibition might be one way of dealing with that. Notice how I say might, we don't really know that much. And the third thing we did was we explored the cerebellum as one center of motor control. A lot of work has gone into trying to understand cerebellar circuits, and yet all we have right now is a model, the Mara Albus hypothesis. It does seem to fit, generally speaking, with reality. There's a lot of con controversy about this on what the cerebellum is actually doing. Regardless, it's clearly very important for movement, as we as Holmes originally knew in, in 1917. So neuroscience is complicated. It, it's really, really complicated. We don't really know that much, and what we do know, we aren't very sure of. Okay. So thank you very much. There's a, a few questions on the chat that I'll nice. answer in a second. Um, but feel free to to ask away. Um, so I'll start off with, I mean, many people won't have this background, so this is basically, I'm only really talking to you now, Ishmael, but um, HEB theory of neuronal growth. So Hebbian, Hebbian plasticity is we're talking about changes and, and adaptations in, in circuits. Um, so HEB's theory doesn't have to do with growth, it has to do with, with circuits changing and, and learning. And orig originally it was thought to, to be occurring in, in the hippocampus, the idea of the place in the brain that we think is concerned with memory. Um, this is the theory of, of plasticity, not necessarily neural growth. Um, we actually now think that the, the hippocampus isn't actually where heavy and plasticity is occurring. The process underlying it is called long-term potentiation. Um, in the long term, we are um, modifying, amplifying synapses. In this case, we were just talking then about long-term depression. I didn't actually use those words but long-term depression in terms of the cerebellum. So that's non-heavy in plasticity. We aren't making engrams. Um, not really. I don't really know what you mean by engram. Um, I think I'd like to be a specialist. Uh, yeah, I'm about to. Yeah. If you actually have a conversation. As, email. I, as I said, my email's on the screen now. So yeah. if you want to talk about it more, um, please do email me. I'm, I'm happy to talk, to talk about it. Much. But the, the one thing that I'll leave you with is look into the idea that HEB theory really literally just means that cells that fire together, they wire together. That's what's parroted about quite a bit. The idea that connections are then made if those cells are firing at the same time. Cool. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Getting into Cambridge or at Cambridge? Yeah, um, so I'm in my third year at Cambridge at Robinson College. It's the newest college. I'd say it's very progressive, very welcoming, very warm. Um, I would say the balance is really, really difficult. Um, 
so I've, I've in my third year I haven't picked an easy subject there are many people that are, are doing much less um, I, I mean, obviously everything is very valid but some subjects will be, take a lot less time than, than a lot of this work will I will spend hours in the library sometimes trying to understand stuff that people just won't I just won't get anywhere with. Um, it's really important to have other stuff, other stuff going on in your life. I'm, I'm involved with, with, with sports teams. I've got other stuff going on in terms of um, outreach work. And again, the balance is, is really key. A lot of people don't have it and it, it really it's really difficult. Um, in terms of just generally challenges. Really getting used to the university mindset. It's very different. Just, uh, a, a, a vet in the year above me said to me when I first joined, it's not possible to know everything. Don't treat it like an A-level or a GCSE revision guide. And that I've really kind of kept that with me because you can really end up feeling like you're drowning. Um, but it, it's 100% definitely something that, that I, I, would consider, I would suggest that you should go for. Um, many people think they can't they go for, for, for Oxbridge and they, they definitely can. Um, there, are, there are many people that, that make it in that that have only been suggested once by one person, then they put it down their application form, they make it in and find that they can thrive. Um, you definitely can. It's obviously intense. It's obviously not easy, but it shouldn't be something you're scared of or rewarded of. And go to open days, have a look around, contact me if you want to know anything else. You know, sure. yeah. What were the options with intercalating? So intercalating is, um, it's, it's an optional thing, but not many people do at most universities. At Cambridge, um, as medical and veterinary students, we are forced to intercalate in our third year. So that's why the course is six years at Cambridge instead of um, five over else. Basically, you can immediately go into any biological science subject for third year. So that can be anything from pharmacology, pathology. Um, my department, as I said right at the start, is physiology, development and neuroscience, and I specifically do the neuroscience theme. That's what I work in, um, but it's, it's just all under the same department. It's the biggest one that all the medics go for, and then just just me and like one or two other vets. Um, and other options that you can do psychology. A lot of the medics tend to go for psychology if they wanted to go into clinical psychiatry, for example. Um, and there's there's a few rogue options. Um, some people do biochemistry. Personally, that would never be my thing. But um, there are some people that go on to do some really interesting things um, that you wouldn't normally see very often. A friend of mine at college, he, he's a medic. He's doing management studies this year. He managed to explain that to his director of studies by saying he wanted to go into private practice and maybe help run his own practice one day and maybe do some consulting work. And, um, I don't know. That, I did hear a rumour that somebody was doing classics this year. I don't know how they've managed to justify that one. But... As a medic, that does not surprise me. Some people, some likes to go for some really random things, but um, if you can justify it, then then generally you can go for it. Yeah. Was there anything that you were particularly interested in that you might want to? to Ishmael. Yeah. Cardiology. Um, cardiology isn't an option <laughs> at at part two in, in third year. It is a uh, so cardiology is something that you would go into in, in clinical school, but you have to do everything all the way through. Um, what you would want to do in that case would be physiology. So physiology, the way that body systems work, um, the way that um, different organs interact. So you, there would be a lot of stuff on the heart. You want to be in my department, physiology, development, neuroscience and PIP physiology modules and psychiatry. That would be psychology. Um, so you're talking there very much from a clinical point of view. When you're intercalating, you're going into basically alongside the scientists. So this is the fundamentals of preclinical science. And then later on in your clinical career, then you could start to really go into cardiology or psychiatry. Um, any other questions from anyone? We'll have to wrap up relatively soon. Yeah, we will have to. Otherwise we'll be locked in. That's fine. All right. Well. Someone's typing. Just give them a second. Yeah. Please do ask anything right now. This is your, your final opportunity. Put your hand up or stick it in the, in the chat. Um, unmute very quickly. Is there anything else? If not, then we can call it a day. I think, yeah. So I think if there is somebody typing and we can have one final little question. I think that's it. I think that's it. Brilliant. Well, thank you all for coming. Well, just, thank you. Yeah, just call. say something as well. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Isaac.
Um, I'm very grateful to Isaac for coming. Uh, he's just come back from Cambridge now. Um, and as you can see, uh, it is an absolutely fascinating subject. Uh, thank you for taking us through the complicated world of neuroscience. Um, should anybody actually want any uh, contact with Isaac, then obviously um, there are some safeguarding issues here. So we will have to, um, uh, can you do it through your um, uh, Oxbridge coordinator and um, we will have some conversation, I'll have some conversations with them as well. Um, thank you very much. Should you have any further questions, um, then obviously we can pass them on to Isaac. Um, I'd like you to uh, express your thanks to Isaac just by giving him a few claps, please, um, on the... Uh, on the emojis if you've got any uh there we go isaac you've got one from ishmael and amia and anybody who can use these yeah isabella yeah okay brilliant and thank you for the uh for the smiley faces too um thank you very much this evening and uh have a lovely evening and thank you isaac